My name is Teach, and this will be Understanding the World of Ice and Fire, the Dawn Age Master Collection. This will be all the other videos jam-packed into one long video, with some new added passages that I had missed from before, and all new commentary. If you prefer to watch them in smaller chunks, the playlist will be linked up above now. Some people who have watched my other videos have told me that they don't know the history of the world of Ice and Fire. So I've decided to start from the beginning and work my way through George R. R. Martin's book, The World of Ice and Fire, chapter by chapter, and try to put certain characters and events from the books in an overall timeline where they belong. To truly understand George R. R. Martin's book, The World of Ice and Fire, you need to know that it is written from the perspective of Maester Yandel of the Citadel. Maesters are men who attend the Citadel to learn about all kinds of subjects. Every time they master a particular subject, they forge a ring of a certain metal to represent that subject. Once they learn many subjects, they forge a chain. Gold for the study of sums and accounts, silver for healing, iron for war, black iron for ravenry, lead for poisons, and valyrian steel for the higher mysteries. The valyrian steel link is the subject of magical arts, at the end of which the maester must spend a whole night trying to light a glass candle. No one has done this in centuries, so most maesters do not believe magic is real. Since we all know Game of Thrones has dragons, giants, and elf-like creatures and the children of the forest, that should tell us already that this book is written in a biased opinion. If you remember, Kyburn once studied at the Citadel. He said that maesters are nothing more than gray sheep, and only one in a hundred have the sense that God gave a goat. He says in order to earn the Valerian Steel Link, you must lose your curiosity. Check out the history and lore videos linked in the descriptions to see Kyburn talk about the maesters and the history of Old Town, where Grand Maester Pycelle and Kyburn argue about its history. Kyburn says maesters serve every great lord with a castle, or a fee while the Citadel serves its own importance. Ultimately, you need to know not everything that the Maesters tell you is 100% true or trustworthy. Let's see if we can peer through the fog of history that Yandel has laid down for us. I've gone through each chapter and taken a few key passages. Now let's see if we can piece together the story or perhaps even theorize one of our own. To do this, we must start in the Dawn Age, which is believed to happen anywhere from 8 to 12,000 years ago. The Dawn Age. There are none who can say with certain knowledge when the world began. Yet this has not stopped many maesters and learned men from seeking the answer. Is it 40,000 years old, as some hold, or perhaps a number as large as 500,000, or even more? It is not written in any book that we know. For in the first age of the world, the Dawn Age, men were not lettered. What little is known to us of those days is contained in the oldest of texts, the tales written down by the Andal, by the Valerians, and by the Gascari, and even by those distant people of fabled Ashai. Yet however ancient those lettered races, they were not even children during the Dawn Age. Most of what is known from this time comes from legend and song. It wasn't written down until many thousands of years later. What can most accurately be told about the Dawn Age? The eastern lands were awash with many peoples, on westerus, from the lands of always winter to the shores of the summer sea. Only two peoples existed, the children of the forest and the race of creatures known as the giants. Of the giants in the Dawn Age, little and less can be said. There is considerable evidence of burials among the giants. They remain creatures of the Dawn Age, even as the ages pass them by. The children of the forest are small as children, but dark and beautiful. They worked no metal, but they had great art in working obsidian, what the small folk called dragon glass, while the Valerians knew it by a word meaning frozen fire. The gods the children worshipped were the nameless ones that would one day become the gods of the first men, the innumerable gods of the streams and forests and stones. More than likely, this was just one god, a Mother Earth-type goddess. It was the children who carved the weirwoods with faces, perhaps to give eyes to their gods so that they might watch their worshippers. Notice how George says perhaps to give their gods eyes, so they may watch their worships. We know this to be true, because Bran and the Three-Eyed Raven can see through the weirwood trees. That the green seers, the wise men of the children, were able to see through the eyes of the carved weirwoods. Mayhap some of the feats of the green seers have more to do with foolish tales than truth. They could not change their forms into those of beasts, as some would have it. But it seems true that they were capable of communicating with animals in a way that we cannot now achieve. It is from this that legends of skin changers or beastlings arose. When George says mayhap some of the feats of the green seers have more to do with foolish tales than truth, we know this is a lie because the green seers can see through the trees and war animals. The phrase play a game called the Lord of the Crossing. In the game, the Lord of the Crossing stands in the middle of a bridge with a staff. When another player approaches, he says, I am the Lord of the Crossing, who goes there? The other player presents his reasons why he should be allowed to cross. The Lord asks questions and makes them swear oaths. 
The player does not have to respond truthfully, but the O's are binding, unless the player says mayhaps quickly enough that the Lord does not notice. Then the player must attempt to knock the Lord off the bridge. So my guess is when George says mayhaps within the books, he's trying to deceive us. But if he says perhaps, there is some truth involved. But all the tears agree that the most common skin changers were men who controlled wolves, even dire wolves. And these had a special name among the wildlings, wags. The most common skin changers were men. So does this mean that the green seers, the wise men of the children of the forest, didn't come around until after the first men came to Westeros? The children of the forest could speak with ravens and could make them repeat their words. According to Bath, this higher mystery was taught to the first men by the children so that ravens could spread messages at a great distance. Legend further holds that the Green Seers could also delve into the past and see far into the future. The beasts of the woods and the giants were eventually joined by other, greater dangers, however. Among the Ironborn, it is said that the first of the first men to come to the Iron Isles found the famous sea stone chair on Old Wick, but that the Isles were uninhabited. If true, the nature and origins of the chair's makers are a mystery. So that ends the chapter of the Dawn Age. Before we go on to the coming of the first men, we have to jump way far forward because there's a little more that we need to know. The Grasslands. It was here, amidst these grasses, that civilization was born in the Dawn Age. 10,000 years ago or more, when Westeros was yet a howling wilderness inhabited only by the giants and children of the forest. The histories of those days are lost to us, sad to say. For the kingdoms of the grass came and went in large measure before the race of man became literate. Only the legends persist. From such we know of the Fisher Queens, who rule the lands adjoining the Silver Sea, the great inland sea at the heart of the grasslands, from a floating palace that made its way endlessly around its shores. The Fisher Queens were wise and benevolent and favored of the gods. Some maesters believe that the first men originated here before beginning the long westward migration that took them across the Arm of Dawn to Westeros. The Fisher Queens were a legendary dynasty that ruled over an equally legendary realm, the realm of the Fisher Queens in Essos. Their kingdom is said to have covered the lands adjoining the Silver Sea, a great inland sea located in what is today the Dothraki Sea, in which only three great lakes remain. This is one of the first civilizations of which there is any sort of record. Even though these records are only legends transmitted through oral transition, as their supposed existence predates written word. So they reign somewhere in this area. Dothraki Sea, and there's are three lakes. This all must have been one great inland sea right here. This is where the where they came from. First men came from here, and they crossed the Armadorn into Westeros. And this brings us to the next chapter, the coming of the first men. But before we get to the coming of the first men, there's still one magical creature we haven't talked about yet. Dragons. The Valyrians themselves claimed that dragons sprang forth as the children of the Fourteen Flames, while in Carth, the tales state that there was once a second moon in the sky. One day, this moon was scalded by the sun and cracked like an egg, and a million dragons poured forth. In Ash Eye, the tales are many and confused, but certain texts, all impossibly ancient, claim that dragons first came from the Shadow, a place where all of our learning fails us. So the Valyrians believe that dragons sprang forth from the 14 flames, which are volcanoes in Valyria, while the Carthian believe that there was once two moons in the sky. One ventured too close to the sun, cracked, and a million dragons poured forth. And then people from Ashai say that dragons came from the shadow. But why couldn't all these be true? Why couldn't the moon have broke and a million dragons rained down along with moon meteors? And then the dragons went and roosted wherever the moon meteors landed. The coming of the first men. According to the most well-regarded accounts from the Citadel, anywhere from 8,000 to 12,000 years ago, the first men came into dawn via the broken arm, which was not yet broken. And as the decades passed, they pushed farther and farther north. Such tales as we have of those migratory days are not to be trusted, for they suggest that within a few short years, the first men had moved beyond the neck and into the north. Yet in truth, it would have taken decades, even centuries, for this to occur. The first men soon came to war with the children of the forest. Unlike the children, the first men farmed the land and raised up ring forts and villages. And in so doing, they took to chopping down the weirwood trees, including those with carved faces. And for this, the children attacked them, leading to hundreds of years of war. Before we continue on with this chapter, let's check out some of the other chapters from the Seven Kingdoms section. We're going to spend the next few minutes jumping around the different chapters of the Seven Kingdoms. But we're going to start with Dorne, because Dorne would have been the first place the first men came to. 
We're going to skip the first part I have highlighted, but then we'll come back. In the Dawn Age, Dawn was the first land that they entered, but few remained, as we have chronicled. Many and more pressed on northward, to the mountains and mayhaps across the salt marshes that once existed where the Sea of Dawn is now. George must be trying to tell us that salt marshes never existed where the Sea of Dawn is today. The first men overwhelmed the elder race wherever they met, for the weapons of the children were made of bone and wood and dragon glass. Finally driven by desperation, the little people turned to sorcery and beseeched their green seers to stem the tide of these invaders. The history of the Stormlands stretches back to the Dawn Age. Long before the coming of the first men, all Westeros belonged to the elder races, the children of the forest and the giants. The children made their homes in the vast primeval forest, so Dawn itself and the Stormlands to the north were the first parts of Westeros to know the steps of men. Although the giants were a shy folk and ever hostile to man, it is written that in the beginning, the children of the forest welcomed the newcomers to Westeros in the belief that there was land enough for all. But the true riches of the rainwood were found in its timber and its rare hardwoods. The harvesting of the trees soon brought the first men into conflict with the children of the forest, however. But now, let's move on to the Westerlands. In the Westerlands, we have a couple paragraphs about the Casterlies. Casterlies originally founded Casterly Rock. Yet by far the greatest lords in the Westerlands were the Casterlies of the Rock, who had their seat in a colossal stone that rose beside the Sunset Sea. Legend tells us that the first Casterly Lord was a huntsman, Corlys, son of Castor, who lived in a village near to where Lannisport stands today. When a lion began preying upon the village sheep, Corlys tracked it back to its den, a cave in the base of the rock. Armed only with a spear, he slew the lion and his mate, but spared her newborn cubs, an act of mercy that so pleased the old gods that they sent a sudden shaft of sunlight deep into the cave, and there, in the stony walls, Corlys beheld the gleam of yellow gold. Because he spared the cubs, the old gods must have thought Corlys was a good person. To defend his treasure against those who would make off with it, he moved inside the cave and fortified its entrance. As years and centuries passed, his descendants delved deeper and deeper into the earth, following the gold, whilst carving halls and galleries and stairways and tunnels into the rock itself, transforming the gigantic stone into a mighty fastness that dwarfed every castle in Westeros. Instead of sharing this wealth with his fellow man, Corlys decided to keep it all for himself. During the long centuries when the first men reigned supreme in Westeros, countless petty kingdoms rose and fell in the Riverlands. Their histories entwined and embroidered with myth and song are largely forgotten, save for the names of a few legendary kings and heroes whose deeds are recorded on weathered stones in rooms, whose meanings are even now disputed at the citadel. Thus, while singers and storytellers may regale us with colorful tales of Artus the Strong, Florian the Fool, Nine Fingered Jack, Chatter the Witch Queen, and the Green King of the God's Eye, the very existence of such personages must be questioned by the serious scholar. Once again, the maesters are arguing about things. And the singers tell us about a few colorful characters. Like, who is this witch queen? And I'm really curious about this green king of the god's eye. Let's see if we can't figure out who he might be. But before we continue on, we have to stop for a minute and talk about war. And how awful men are during war. Especially the Lannisters. They rape, pillage, and plunder and burn everything in their wake. So what do you think would happen if the first men found the god's eye with Nyssa Nyssa, a sleeping goddess, in her tree? Well, I would imagine they would rape her too. And during this violation, she screams out and it shatters one of the moons in the sky, causing the first long night. The fire moon broke and rained all over the world and rained black stone everywhere, with a large chunk landing near a shy. Some of it clearly must have landed on Valyria as well. Dragons came from the broken fire moon and they went and they roosted in a shy by the shadow and Valyria in the 14 flames. And also, there's a black stone down in Old Town. Dragons might have came to roost there as well. So now that we got to the vent that I think caused the breaking, let's go back to Dorn and finish off that section. The breaking. The single most important event in Dornish history, and mayhaps the history of all Westeros, is one about which, to our frustration, we know far too little. George says mayhaps, so the breaking is not the most important thing to happen in Westeros. My guess is that the most important thing to happen was the pact. Gathering in their hundreds, some say on the Isle of Faces, and calling on their old gods with song and prayer and grisly sacrifice. A thousand captive men were fed to the weirwood, one version of the tale goes, whilst another claims the children use the blood of their own young. Blood sacrifice is always so important in Game of Thrones, but ultimately, I think they got it wrong. It was Nissa Nissa's maiden's blood. And the old gods stirred, and giants awoke in the earth, and all of Westeros shook and trembled. Great cracks appeared in the earth, and hills and mountains collapsed and were swallowed up. And then the seas came rushing in, 
and the arm of dawn was broken and shattered by the force of the water until only a few bare rocky islands remained above the waves. The summer sea joined the narrow sea and the bridge between Essos and Westeros vanished for all time. This violation caused Nissa Nissa to stir and her scream was so loud it woke giants in the earth. This might be where giants actually came from. All of Westeros shook and trembled and hills and mountains collapsed and were swallowed up. Her scream was so powerful that it shattered the fiery moon and it rained all over the world with a very large chunk landing in a shy by the shadow. And this caused the seas to come rushing in and the arm of Dorn was broken and shattered by the force of the waters. Or so the legend says. Most scholars do agree that Essos and Westeros were once joined. Today the seas divide them. So plainly some version of the event the Dornish call the breaking must have occurred. Was it the work of the children of the forest and the sorcery of their green seers? These things are less certain. Archmacer Cassandra suggests that it was not the singing of green seers that parted Westeros from Essos, but rather what he calls the song of the sea, a slow rising of the waters that took place over centuries, not in a single day. Well, I have to give it to Archmaester Cassanders. He was right. It wasn't the singing of the green singers, but it definitely wasn't the slow rising of the waters either. Even if we accept that the old gods broke the arm of dawn with the hammer of the waters, as the legends claim, the green seers sang their song too late. So many of their forebears had already made the crossing that they outnumbered the dwindling elder races almost three to one by the time the lands were severed. And that disparity only grew in the centuries that followed. This is the only time in the book that they refer to the hammer of the waters, which makes sense because a meteor is striking the ocean and it's definitely hammering the water. The fact that they point out the singers sang their song too late because the men already outnumbered the elder races three to one should be a big hint that something else actually happened. So with that, let's move on to the next section. Just as we speak of the hundred kingdoms of yore, though there was never a time when Westeros was actually divided into a hundred independent states. I'm adding this section about the hundred kingdoms of yore because during this time, Westeros was probably broken down into many kingdoms, probably close to a hundred or even more. The Macy's are just voicing their opinions again. Ultimately, the number 100 is going to be a symbolic identifier for us later on. Barrington II is somewhat of a curiosity, a gathering place built at the foot of the reputed Barrow of the First King, who once ruled supreme over all the First Men, the Dustins, loyal bannermen to the Starks, who have ruled the Barrowlands in their name since the fall of the last of the Barrow Kings. The rustic crown upon the arms of House Dustin derives from their claim that they are themselves descended from the first king and the Barrow Kings who ruled after him. The Dustins are descendant of the first king who led the first men across the arm of Dorne into Westeros. The old tales recorded in Kennet's Passages of the Dead claim that a curse was placed on the great Barrow that would allow no living man to rival the first king. This curse made these pretenders to the title grow corpse-like in their appearance as it sucked away their vitality and life. A curse that made people grow corpse-like and sucked away their vitality? I bet I could find a few characters that fit that description within this world. The men of the North are descendants of the First Men, their blood only slowly mingling with that of the Andals, who overwhelmed the kingdoms to the south. The other aspects of their culture have faded away, such as the grislier aspects of their worship when criminals and traitors were killed and their bodies and entrails hung from the branches of weirwoods. Or blood sacrifice. How do you open the eyes of a weirwood tree? Is carving a face into it enough? Or does it perhaps take blood sacrifice? One notable custom that the Northmen hold dearer than any other is guest right, the tradition of hospitality by which a man may offer no harm to a guest beneath his roof, nor a guest to his host. So what's the deal with guest right? Where did this originate from? And you really have to understand the wording here. Guest right is the tradition of hospitality in which a man may offer no harm to a guest beneath his roof, nor can that guest do harm to his host. Where did this come from? What happened to make this so important to the first men? In the north, they tell the tale of the Rat Cook, who served an Andal king, identified by some as King Kaiwell II of the Rock, and by others as King Oswald I of the Vale and Mountain, the flesh of the king's own son baked into a pie. The king that the Rat Cook served was either a Lannister of Casterly Rock or an Aaron of the Vale. He was punished by being turned into a monstrous rat that ate its own young. Yet, the punishment was incurred not for killing the king's son or for feeding him to the king, but for the breaking of guest right. The gods weren't mad that he killed the king's son and fed him to the king. They were mad that the king was promised guest right and this guy broke it. Now I'm starting to think Nissa Nissa invited the first men to her island before they violated her. So guest right very well may have been part of the pact. 
And that's why it's so important to the first men and the men of the north, because they remember. All right, I have a couple lines from the veil I want to go over. The first Sir Artis Aaron supposedly rode upon a huge falcon, possibly a distorted memory of dragon riders seen from afar, Archmaester Periston suggests. Armies of eagles fought at his command. To win the veil, he flew to the top of the giant's lance and slew the griffin king. He counted giants and merlings amongst his friends and wed a woman of the children of the forest, though she died giving birth to his son. This seems like an important passage. It talks about someone possibly riding a dragon in the Dawn Age and intermarrying with the children of the forest. A hundred other tales are told of him, most of them just as fanciful. If such a hero ever walked the mountains and vale, far back in the dim mists of the Dawn Age, his name was certainly not Artis Aaron, for the Aarons came from pure Andal stock. Like as not, it was the singers of the Bale who conflated these two figures, attributing the deeds of the legendary Winged Knight to the historic Falcon Knight, perhaps in order to curry favor with the real Arthur's Aaron's successors. The singers have seemed to merge the Winged Knight and the Falcon Knight together, but the Winged Knight is from the Dawn Age, while the Falcon Knight didn't come around for many thousands of years. The Winged Knight has a hundred tales told about him, and if you remember, I said the number 100 will be a symbolic identifier. So the Winged Knight may have been related to Azor Ahai, or the last hero. The Iron Islands. Were the first men truly first? Most scholars believe they were. But on the Iron Islands, the priests of the drowned god tell a different tale. According to their faith, the Ironborn are a race apart from the common run of mankind. We did not come to these holy islands from godless lands across the seas. We came from beneath those seas, from the watery halls of the drowned god, who made us in his likeness, and gave to us dominion over all the waters of the earth. Even among the ironborn, there are some who doubt this and acknowledge the more widely accepted view of an ancient descent from the first men. If you take in consideration my theory, then we possibly have a demigod walking around out there. And there is a legend in the Iron Islands about the great king who took a mermaid to wife. We'll get more into him once we get to the chapter about the Age of Heroes, though. Archmaester Hayrig once advanced the interesting notion that the ancestors of the ironborn came from some unknown land west of the Sunset Sea citing the legend of the sea stone chair. The throne of the Greyjoys, carved into the shape of a kraken from an oily back stone, was said to have been found by the first men when they first came to Old Wick. Hayrig argued that the chair was a product of the first inhabitants of the islands. The Iron Islands is the first place Azor Ahai encounters the black greasy stone. After meeting with the drowned god, he transfigures the stone into the sea stone chair. It cannot be denied that they stand apart with customs, beliefs, and ways of governance quite unlike those common elsewhere in the Seven Kingdoms. The thin soil did not support the growth of weirwoods. No giants ever made their homes here, nor did the children of the forest walk what woods there were. The old gods worshipped by these elder races were likewise absent, and though the Andals did reach the islands eventually, their faith never took root here either. For another god had come before the Seven, the Drowned God, creator of the seas and father of the Ironborn. This passage definitely makes it seem like Mother Earth had no part of the Iron Islands. The Iron Islands must have belonged to the realm of the Drowned God. Yet even more than the fishermen, Arnborn esteemed their reavers. Wolves of the sea, the men of the Westlands and Riverlands named them in days of yore. So the days of yore reverts to the Dawn Age, and the Ironborn during this time were known as the Wolves of the Sea, almost like they were a precursor to House Stark. Many legends have come down to us through the millennia of the salt kings and reavers who made the sunset sea their own, men as wild and cruel and fearless as any who have ever lived. Thus we hear of the likes of Torgan the Terrible, Jol the Whale, Dagon Drum the Necromancer, Hrothgar of Pike and his Kraken the Summoning Horn, and Ragged Ralph of Old Wick. Wow, that sounds like a great bunch of guys there. One of them's known as the Terrible, another the Whale, Another guy's known as the Necromancer, and some dude's got a horn that will summon a kraken. These guys sound like some top-notch ironborn. Most infamous of all was Balin Blackskin, who fought with an axe in his left hand and a hammer in his right. No weapon made of man could harm him, it was said. Swords glanced off and left no mark, and axes shattered against his skin. Did such men ever truly walk the earth? It is hard to know, so much of what we know of these demigods of the dawn comes to us from the peoples they plundered and preyed upon. Wait, what? This dude fought with an axe in his left hand and a hammer in his right, and no weapon made of man could harm him? Where is this dude's show? Okay, here we go. The last section of the coming of the first men, and we're going to learn all about Goth Greenhand. Goth Greenhand. The story of the Reach begins with Goth Greenhand, the legendary progenitor not only of the Tyrells of Highgarden, but of the Gardener kings before them, and all the other great houses and noble families of the Green Realm as well and probably most of Westeros. 
A thousand tales are told of Goths in the reach and beyond. Most are implausible and many contradictory. In some, he is a contemporary of Bran the Builder, Land the Clever, Durin Godsby, and the other colorful figures of the Age of Heroes. In others, he stands as the ancestor of them all. Goth was the High King of the First Men, it is written. It was he who led them out of the East and across the land bridge to Westeros. Yet other tales would have us believe that he preceded the arrival of the First Men by thousands of years, making him not only the first man in Westeros, but the only man. Keep in mind, the Northmen say that the First King led the First Men into Westeros, not Garth. And I tend to agree with the North, because the North remembers. Some even say he was a god. There is disagreement even on his name. Garth Greenhand, we call him. But in the oldest tales, he is named Garth Greenhair, or simply Garth the Green. Some stories say he had green hands, green hair, or green skin overall. A few even give him antlers like a stag. Interesting. I have a theory that Azor High was the first great seer. And then in the Reach, we have a legend of a green godlike man who most people in the Reach claim to be descended from. A few of the very oldest tales of Garth Greenhand present us with a considerably darker deity, one who demanded blood sacrifice from his worshippers to ensure a bountiful harvest. In some stories, the green god dies every autumn when the trees lose their leaves, only to be reborn with the coming of spring. This version of Garth is largely forgotten. Blood sacrifice seems to be the key for the most powerful magic. Who knows where he might disappear to in the winter? I bet it was somewhere gray. Many of the more primitive peoples of the earth worship a fertility god or goddess, and Garth Greenhand has much and more in common with his deities. Where he walked, farms and villages and orchards sprouted up behind him. About his shoulders was slung a canvas bag, heavy with seed, which he scattered as he went along. As befits a god, his bag was inexhaustible. Within were seeds for all the world's trees and grains and fruits and flowers. Garth seems to be some kind of creationist. Wherever he went, civilization sprouted up behind him. His inexhaustible bag can be seen as there is no need for him to use that seed because he can create it with his magical hands. Or he was dropping seeds from his sack, meaning everyone in the world is related to him. Maybe even both. For the legends tell us that he could make barren women fruitful with a touch. Even crones, whose moon blood no longer flowed. Maidens ripened in his presence. Mothers brought forth twins or even triplets when he blessed them. Young girls flowered at his smile. Lords and common men alike offered up their virgin daughters to him wherever he went. That their crops might ripen and their trees grow heavy with fruit. Wow, this guy is starting to sound more and more godlike with every passage. These legends, though cherished by the small folk, are largely discounted by both the maesters of the citadel and the septums of the faith, who share the view that Garth Greenhand was a man, not a god. A hunter or war chief, most likely. Or perhaps a petty king. He might well have been the first lord of the first men to lead his followers across the arm of dawn, as yet unbroken. Here we go again. The maesters are discounting magic. They don't believe it was real. But we also get a perhaps here. And I think this perhaps is true that he led the first men across the arm of Dorn, but I believe it was broken already. And he led the first men back to Essos. God or man, Garth Greenhand fathered many children in this new land. On this, all the tales agree. Many of those offspring grew to be heroes, kings, and great lords in their own right, founding mighty houses that endured for thousands of years. I mean, the Age of Heroes is right around the corner, so I imagine he fathered a lot of heroes. Even the heroes of other lands and kingdoms are sometimes numbered amongst the offspring of the Green Hand. Brandon the Builder was descended from Goth by way of Brandon of the Bloody Blade, these tales would have us believe. Whilst Lan the Clever was a bastard born to Flores the Fox in some tales, or Rowan Goldtree in others. I'm going to have to agree with the small folk and say that Garth Greenhand was a godly man. Perhaps he is the evidence Nissa Nissa had a son. Old Town. No history of the Reach is complete without a look at Old Town. How old is Old Town, truly? Many a maester has pondered that question, but we simply do not know. The origins of the city are lost in the mists of time and clouded by legend. Dragons once roosted on the Battle Isle until the first high tower put an end to them. The full and true history of the founding of Old Town will likely never be known. Okay, we get it. Old Town is old, and most of its history has been lost to time. So let's see if we can fill in some of the gaps. We can state with certainty, however, that men have lived at the mouth of the honey wine since the Dawn Age. If men have been there since the Dawn Age, that means Garth Greenhand must have been there at some point. Maester Jellico suggests that the settlement at the top of Whispering Sound began as a trading post where ships from Valeria, Old Gis, and the Summer Isles put in to replenish their provisions, make repairs, and barter with the elder races. And that seems as likely a supposition as any. Valeria was not around in the Dawn Age, and I doubt Old Gis was either. 
Yet mysteries remain. The stony island where the high tower stands is known as Battle Isle, even in our oldest records. But why? What battle was fought there? When? Between which lords, which kings, which races? Even the singers are largely silent on these matters. I think we can assume Garth Greenhand would have been involved with whatever happened at Battle Isle as he ruled the Reach during this time. Even more enigmatic to scholars and historians is the great square fortress of black stone that dominates that isle. For most of recorded history, this monumental edifice has served as the foundation and lowest level of the high tower. Yet we know for a certainty that it predates the upper levels of the tower by thousands of years. More black stone, and this seems to be a much larger chunk of moon meteor than the sea stone chair. Who built it? When? Why? Most maesters accept the common wisdom that declares it to be a valerian construction, for its massive walls and labyrinthine interiors are all of solid rock, with no hint of joins or mortar, no chisel marks of any kind. A type of construction that is seen elsewhere most notably in the dragon roads of the freehold of Valeria. I'm just saying. This description sounds like some kind of godly man went up and touched it with his magical hands and transfigured its labyrinthine passages as he walked through it. If indeed this first fortress is Valerian, it suggests that the Dragon Lords came to Westeros thousands of years before they carved out their outpost on Dragonstone, long before the coming of the Andals or even the First Men. If so, did they come seeking trade? Were they slavers? Mayhaps seeking after giants? Did they seek to learn the magic of the children of the forest with their green seers and their werewoods? Or was there some darker purpose? Another mayhaps. And I'm going to say this whole passage is a lie. The Valerians did not exist during this time. If seafarers did come to Old Town in the Dawn Age, they must have sailed east to Westeros, coming from somewhere near Shy, fleeing the shadow or the broken meteor chunk that landed near there. More troubling and more worthy of consideration are the arguments put forth by those who claim that the first fortress is not Valerian at all. There we go, now someone's on the right track. The fused black stone of which it is made suggests Valeria, but the plain, unadorned style of architecture does not. For the Dragon Lords love little more than twisting stone into strange, fanciful, and ornate shapes. Okay, finally we get some people who are using their eyes. Within the narrow, twisting, windowless passages strike many as being tunnels rather than halls. It's very easy to get lost among their turnings. Perhaps Garth Greenhand used his magical hands to transfigure the stone as he walked through investigating it. Mayhaps this is no more than a defensive measure designed to confound attackers, but it too is singularly unvalerian. I think this mayhaps helps us here, so now we know that it's not a defensive measure and not valerian. The labyrinthine nature of its interior architecture has led Archmaester Killian to suggest that the fortress might have been the work of the Maze Makers, a mysterious people who left remnants of their vanished civilization upon Loras in the Shivering Sea. The notion is intriguing, but raises more questions than it answers. The maze makers of Lorath, huh? Looks like we're gonna have to take a closer look at them. An even more fanciful possibility was put forth a century ago by Maester Theron. Theron noted a certain likeness between the black stone of the ancient fortress and that of the sea stone chill, the high seat of House Greyjoy of Pike, whose origins are similarly ancient and mysterious. If Garth Greenhand is Azor Ahai and was born in the north, he would have had to pass the Iron Islands on his way to the Reach. There, he might have talked with the Drown God and carved a black meteor into the sea stone chair. Theron's rather inchoate manuscript, Strange Stone, postulates that both fortress and seat might be the work of a queer, misshapen race of half-men, sired by creatures of the salt seas upon human women. These deep ones, as he names them, are the seed from which our legends of Merlings have grown, he argues whilst their terrible fathers are the truth behind the drowned god of the Arnborn. Just a quick theory here. If our demigod got with one of these deep ones, which produced a Merlin, and then he or one of his sons might have gotten with the Merlin, which created the Ironborn. Not really sure if there's any weight, but it was just a thought. In any case, his thesis has no factual basis and may safely be dismissed. And thus we find ourselves back whence we began, forced to concede that the beginnings of Old Town, Battle Isle, and its fortress must forever remain a mystery to us. Hey wait, let's not dismiss this guy just yet. Perhaps Battle Isle was a battle between Garth Greenhands and the Deep Ones. The reasons for the abandonment of the fortress and the fate of its builders, whoever they might have been, are likewise lost to us. But at some point we know that Battle Isle and its great stronghold came into the possession of the ancestors of House Hightower. I believe Garth abandoned this fortress after those so-called seafarers told him about a great stone that fell far to the east near a shy. 
Were they first men, as most scholars believe today? Or did they mayhaps descend from the seafarers and traders who had settled at the top of Whispering Sound in earlier epochs? The men who came before the first men? We cannot know. Ooh, this mayhaps hurts. It tells me one of my theories is wrong. I always figured that the High Towers were descended from the seafarers and Garth Greenham, but this must not be the case. They must be descendants of only Garth himself. In the last few episodes, I've proposed a theory to you that Nissa Nissa was a Mother Earth goddess who was violated by the First Men. During this violation, she screams out and she breaks the fiery moon and black stone reigns all across the world. Eventually, she gives birth to her son, Azor Ahai, and together they are able to put an end to this first long night. Azor Ahai then travels the Seven Kingdoms and is known by many different names. In the Reach, we knew him as Garth Greenhand. In Old Town, we learned about seafarers that possibly came to the Seven Kingdoms, and I theorized that they would have sailed east to Westeros from somewhere near Ashai, fleeing the giant meteor that landed near there. Once in Westeros, they tell Garth Greenhand about the giant stone that fell near Ashai, at which point he decides to leave Westeros to go investigate. Now, if you're here in Old Town and you wanted to go over here by Ashai by the Shadow, I think the easiest way would be to take a boat, and you should sail down through the Summer Sea and stop the Summer Isles and Baskalus Isles and Sithorios to resupply along your way. So now, let's start down in the Summer Isles. The Summer Isles, south of Westeros, cradled in the deep blue waters of the Summer Sea. The summer isles bask in the warm southern sun. Flowers of a thousand different sorts bloom in profusion on the summer isles, filling the air with their perfume. The trees are heavy with exotic fruits. Wasn't Garth Greenhand said to walk around with a canvas sack full of seeds for flowers and fruit trees? The summer islanders are a dark people, black of hair and eye, with skins as brown as teak or as black as polished jet. For much of their recorded history, they lived in isolation from the rest of mankind. Their earliest maps, as carved into the famous talking trees, of Tall Trees Town show no lands but the isles themselves, surrounded by a vast world-spanning ocean. Wait a second. These guys have talking trees? Do you think the trees whisper to them? Ultimately, most of this information deals with the rise of Valyria, so we'll come back to it. But there are a few interesting things that we should check out while we're here. Lomas Longstrider, who visited the Summer Isles in his search for wonders, recorded that the sages of the isles claimed that their ancestors once reached the western shores of Sothorius and founded cities there, only to have them overwhelmed and destroyed by the same forces that wiped out later Iskari and Valyrian settlements on that perilous continent. I'm not totally sure why they're trying to throw us off here, because there is an ancient city called Ying on Sothorios. The Summer Islanders have never once invaded any lands beyond their own shores, nor attempted the conquest of any foreign people. The Summer Islanders are a very peaceful people. Their great swan ships sail farther and faster than the vessels of any other nation, to the very ends of the earth. Almost like they've been sailing their entire lives. Wars on the Summer Isles seldom last longer than a day, and do no harm to any but the warriors themselves. No crops are destroyed, no homes are put to the torch, no cities are sacked, no children are harmed, no women are raped. No worry women are fight beside their men in the line of battle. These people seem quite the opposite of the people of the Seven Kingdoms, especially the Lannisters and the Ironborn, almost as whoever founded these people were taught better. The other Summer Isles, whilst Jala, Wilano, and Omboru dominate the archipelago, a number of the smaller isles are worthy of mention. We'll come back to the history of the main islands later, but for now, let's look at some of these smaller ones. The Singing Stones, west of the main isles, have jagged peaks so riddled with holes and airways that they make a strange music when the wind blows. The people of the stones can tell which way the wind is blowing from the sound of their song. Whether gods or men taught the stones to sing, no one can say. Sounds like some magical hands were involved to me. Stonehead, the northernmost island in the chain, is plainly the work of men. The north face of this sea-girt rock has been carved in the stern likeness of some forgotten god, glowering out across the sea. His is the last visage that summer islanders see as they sail north to Westeros. Come on now, this forgotten god is glowering out at the sea, going towards Westeros? Though a score of gods, both great and small, are honored on the Summer Isles, a special reverence is shown to the god and goddess of love, beauty, and fertility. Well now, this sounds like Garth Greenham. But who's this goddess? Is this Nissa Nissa? Or does Azor Ahai possibly have siblings? Could he be green, his brother black, and his sister white? Maybe these are the three heads of the dragon. I'm not too sure about that yet. Let's keep going for now. Nah. Northwest of Sothorius in the Summer Sea lies the mysterious island of Nath, known to the ancients as the Isle of Butterflies. The god of Nath is called the Lord of Harmony, off shown as a laughing giant, bearded and naked, always attended by swarms of slender maidens with butterfly wings. Check out this picture of Garth in the Seven Kingdoms. Kind of looks like a similar description, doesn't it? A hundred varieties of butterflies flitter about the island. The Nathi revere them as messengers of the Lord, charged with the protection of his people. 
Mayhaps there is some truth to these legends, for whilst the docile nature of the Nathi seem to make their island ripe for conquest, strangers from beyond the sea do not live long upon the Isle of Butterflies. And then we get a Mayhaps here. And this Mayhaps is saying that they're not messengers of the Lord charged with protection of his people. This is letting us know that he made 100 butterflies for his 100 queens from the 100 kingdoms of yore. Okay, so it looks like there could be some evidence of Garth visiting the Summer Isles and Nath. Let's see if we can see him in the Basculus Isles and Sithorios as well. Ruins found upon the Isle of Tears, the Isle of Toads, an axe island hint at some ancient civilization, but little is now known of these vanished men of the Dawn Age. If any still survive when the first corsairs settled on the islands, they were soon put to the sword, so no trace of them now remains, save perhaps upon the Isle of Toads. Okay, let's go check out the Isle of Toads then. On the Isle of Toads can be found an ancient idol, a greasy black stone crudely carved in the semblance of a gigantic toad of malignant aspect, some 40 feet high. The people of this isle are believed by some to be descended from those who carved the toadstone, for there is an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces, and many have webbed hands and feet. A black greasy stone carved to look like a toad and some strange fish-looking people. Would you believe me that there are other fish-looking people in the world? Okay, there wasn't a whole lot to go on there in the Basculus Isles, but on the Isle of Toads, there is a black greasy stone. Now let's check on Sothorios. Sothorios. Men have known of the existence of the vast savage land to the south, since the first of them took to the sea in ships. For only the width of the summer sea separates Sothoris from the ancient civilizations and great cities of Essos and Westphys. Yet we cannot claim to know Sothoris well. Its interior remains a mystery to us, covered by impenetrable jungle, where ancient cities full of ghosts lie in ruins beside great sluggish rivers. Colonies planted here wither and die. We do not even know the true size of Sothorius. Whatever its true extent, the southern continent is an unhealthy place. Blood boiled, green fever, sweet rot, bronze fate, the red death, gray scale, brown leg, worm bone, sailor's bane, pus eye, and yellow gum are only a few of the diseases found there. This place sounds pretty awesome. People should totally come visit here on their next vacation. Counts suggest that nine of every ten men visiting Sothorius from Westeros will suffer one or more of these afflictions, and that almost half will die. Nor is disease the only danger that those who seek to know this wet green land must face. Wait. You mean it actually gets worse? Huge crocodiles lurk beneath the surface of the Zamoyas. Other streams are infested by swarms of carnivorous fish capable of stripping the flesh from a man's bones in minutes. There are stinging flies, venomous snakes, wasps and worms that lay their eggs beneath the skins of horses, hogs, and men alike. In the forest south of Yin, there are said to be apes that dwarf the largest giants, so powerful they can slay elephants with a single blow. Farther south lie the regions known as the Green Hell, where beasts even more fearsome are said to dwell. Caverns full of pale white vampire bats, tattooed lizards stalk the jungles. Snakes 50 feet long slither through the underbrush, and spotted spiders weave their webs amongst the great trees. Okay, maybe don't schedule your next vacation here. Most terrible of all are the wyverns, those tyrants of the southern skies with their great leathery wings, cruel beaks, and insatiable hunger. Close kin to dragons, wyverns cannot breathe fire, but they exceed their cousins in ferocity and are a match for them in all other respects save size. Brindled wyverns, with their distinctive jade and white scales, swamp wyverns have been known to attain an even greater size. Brown bellies, no larger than monkeys, are even more dangerous than their larger kin. But most dreaded of all, is the Shadow Wing, a nocturnal monster whose black scales and wings make him all but invisible. Do you think the brindled writhens are Garth's attempt to breed with his dragon from Old Town? Maesters and other scholars alike have puzzled over the greatest of the enigmas of Sothorius, the ancient city of Yin, a ruin older than time, built of oily black stone. This must be one of the cities that the ancient summer islanders were talking about. It's made out of greasy black stone. So I think I'm gonna have to credit this to our demigod. It would require a dozen elephants to move them. Yin has remained a desolation for many thousands of years, yet the jungle that surrounds it on every side has scarce touched it. A city so evil that even the jungle will not enter, Nymeria is supposed to have said when she laid eyes on it, if the tales are true. Every attempt to rebuild or resettle Yin has ended in horror. This place is a haunted ruin. I would really like to know what happened here that drove Azora High and his people back to the Summer Isles. The Sothori are big bone creatures, massively muscled, with long arms, sloped foreheads, huge square teeth, heavy jaws, and coarse black hair. What's going on with this place? It almost seems like someone was interbreeding animals with different species. Their broad, flat noses suggest snouts, and their thick skins are brindled in patterns of brown and white that seem more hug-like than human. Sothori women cannot breed with any save their own males. When mated with men from Essos or Westeros, they bring forth only stillbirths, many hideously malformed. These people have some interesting characteristics. I wonder if we can match them up anywhere else in the world. The Sothori 
that dwell closest to the sea have learned to speak the trade talk. Farther south, the trappings of civilization fall away, and the brindle men become even more savage and barbaric. These Sathori worship dark gods with obscene rites. Many are cannibals and more are ghouls when they cannot feast upon the flesh of foes and strangers as they eat their own dead. So these brindle men aren't human, but they do seem to be highly intelligent. They worship dark gods and eat people, sometimes eating their own kind. These might be the worst creatures on the planet. Some say there were other races here, once forgotten peoples, destroyed, devoured, or driven out by the brindle men. Tales of lizard men, lost cities, and eyeless cave dwellers are commonplace. No proof exists for any of these. So it seems as Garth Greenhand left Old Town, he took a southern passage towards the Shy, landing in the Summer Isles, Nath, and the Basilisk Isles. And he was creating very peaceful civilizations. Once he hit Sathorios, though, he encountered resistance of some kind, and they were forced to retreat. At this point, he had to come back to Westeros. This might be where he was disappearing to during the winters. But once he returns to Westeros, he's going to try again, and this time he's going to take a land passage. Mostly. He's still got to cross the step stones. And then the first place we should be able to pick him up in at that point is in Mir. Beyond the Sunset Kingdom, other lands. Westeros forms but one small part of our world, the far reaches of which yet remain unknown even to the wisest of men. Reach has its own character and contributes its own colors and patterns to the vast tapestry that we call the known world. For now, let us begin with our closest and best known neighbors, the Free Cities. Their histories are known to us from the records their own scholars and magisters have made over centuries, reaching to the earliest times of their establishment as freeholds. It is thanks to these same records that something of the histories of the peoples who preceded the Valerians are known to us. Good. I was hoping for something like this. Some information that comes from pre-Valeria. Any information that came from Valeria has probably been heavily edited to favor the Valerians themselves. One issue that plagues all studies of the ancient records is how differently the varied cultures reckon days and seasons and years. But there is little consensus on what the dates we have actually mean in our own reckoning. That's good to hear. That means we can play fast and loose with our timeline. The Free Cities. S is the vast continent across the narrow sea, teams with strange, exotic, and ancient civilizations. Some still extant and striving, others long fallen and lost to legend. Most of these are far too distant to be of any concern to the people of the Seven Kingdoms save mayhaps for those seafarers bold enough to sail strange waters in search of gold and glory. This mayhaps hit the nail on the head. Essos is important. You must put its history together with Westeros's to paint a clear picture. Each of the free cities has its own history and character. Eight of the nine free cities are proud daughters of Valeria that was. In these cities, Valerian blood is still greatly prized. Yeah, we know blood is important. The distinction that sets the Nine apart is not their size, but their origins. Such was never true of Volantis and the rest of the Nine. Though born of Valeria, each was independent of its mother from birth. Good. That means some of these cities are older than the Dragon Lords. Let's start with Mir, because it would be the closest city on foot to Westeros. The origins of Mir are murkier. The Mirmen are believed by certain maesters to be akin to the Roynor, as many of them share the same olive skin and dark hair as the river people. But this supposed link is likely spurious. Seems legit to me. Olive is a dark green color, and most of Westeros is already related to Garth Greenhand. There are certain signs that a city stood where Mir now stands. Even during the Dawn Age and the Long Night, raised by some ancient vanished people. They vanished, huh? Well, let's move on and see if we can't pick up the trail somewhere else. So we had no luck in Mir. And I tried looking up these ruined cities here, and most of them had to do with Nymeria. But there is mention of the Prince of Nysar in Novas. So let's go on to Novas and see what we can find there. The Novashi work the land on the terraced farms. Makes sense. Everywhere Garth went, villages and farms sprouted up behind him. Though Great Novas dominates the headwaters of the Rhoyne today, the Novashi are not descended from the Rhoynar who ruled that mighty river of old. Like the other free cities, Novas is a daughter of Valeria. Yet before the Valerians, another people dwelt along the Noin, where Novas stands today, raising rude villages of their own. There you go. There are those villages to go with those farms. Who were these predecessors? Some believe them to have been kin to the maze makers of Lorath. But that seems unlikely, for they built in wood, not stone, and left no mazes to confound us. Others suggest that they were cousins of the men of Ib. Most, however, believe them to have been Andals. Oh yeah, the maze makers. Didn't some maester think that they could be responsible for the Blackstone Fortress in Old Town? And then some people think that the Novashi could be descendants of the men of Ib? We're going to have to check them out. 
But they couldn't have been Andals, because the Andals weren't around during this time. Whoever these first Novoshi might have been, their towns did not survive. Legend tells us they were driven from the Noin by an onslaught of hairy men out of the east, surely some close kin of the Ibanese. These invaders, in turn, were expelled by the fabled prince of Nysar, Garrus the Grey. If the hairy men are close kin to the Ibanese and came to conquer them, it makes sense that people think that they could be related to them. Then the hairy men were pushed out by the fabled prince of Nysar, Garth the uh, oh, I mean, Garrus the Grey? Wait a second. Wasn't there a curse about great kings turning gray and corpse-like? So the Novashi needed help from the famed Prince of Nysar, Garrus the Grey. But some people think that they could be related to the Lorathi, who are the maze makers. So now let's move on up and check out Lorath. Lorath, the free city of Lorath, stands upon the western end of the largest in a cluster of low, stony islands in the Shivering Sea, north of Issos near the mouth of Lorath Bay. In ancient days, the Isles were home to the mysterious race of men known as the Maze Makers, who vanished long before the dawn of true history, leaving no trace of themselves save for their bones and the mazes they built. It kind of sounds like these people just up and left. Others followed the Maze Makers on Lorath in the centuries that followed. For time, the Isles were home to a small, dark, hairy people, akin to the men of Ib. Men from Ib? Aren't those the ones that tried to destroy Novas? Fisher folk, they lived along the coast and shun the great mazes of their predecessors. They shun the mazes? I wonder why. I wonder if their descendants tried to attack the original settlers of Lorath, but the mazes were built as a defense. If their ancestors had attacked and gotten lost in the mazes for generations, I think that would explain why they shun these mazes. Sprawling constructs of bewildering complexity made from blocks of hewn stone, the maze makers' constructions are scattered across the aisles and one badly overgrown and sunk deep into the earth has been found on Essos proper, on the peninsula south of Lorath. Badly overgrown and sunken into the ground? Seems to me like the one on Essos might be the original one. Lorassian, the second largest of the Lorath Isles, is home to a vast maze that fills more than three quarters of the surface area of the island and includes four levels beneath the ground, with some passages descending 500 feet. These mazes sound like a great defensive measure. People would get lost for entire lifetimes. Scholars still debate the purpose of these mazes. Were they fortifications, temples, towns? Or did they serve some other, stranger purpose? Think about it. As the Zora High went south, he promoted peace. They had no warriors. So he came up with a new strategy. These mazes were fortified cities that any would-be conqueror would get lost in. Their bones tell us that they were massively built and larger than men, though not so large as giants. Some have suggested that, mayhaps, the maze makers were born of interbreeding between human men and giant women. And we get a mayhaps. No, not giants. These people, too, are descendants of Garth. Remember in Nath, he's the god of harmony, and he's depicted as a laughing giant? We do not know why they disappeared, though Lorathi legends suggest they were destroyed by an enemy from the sea. Merlings in some versions of the tale, Selkies and walrus men in others. I suppose they left Yin behind, so why couldn't they do the same here? Otherwise, it sounds like the Deep Ones might have gotten to them. So it seems that in Lorath, Garth created giant mazes as a defense to detour any would-be conquerors. Eventually, they either left or were forced out. But at this point, they're pretty close to the Silver Sea and the Kingdom of the Fisher Queens. So let's move a little more east and see if we can't pick him up in the Kingdom of Sarnor. If you remember, way back in the first one, we talked about the grasslands and the, and the kingdom of the Fisher Queens. And some maesters believe that the first men originated here before their long westward migration that took them across the Armador into Westeros. Tales are told of the Hairy Men, a race of shaggy, savage warriors who rode to battle on unicorns. Though larger than the Ibanese of the present, they may well have been their forebears. The Hairy Men are the forebears to the Ibanese. These are the same people that once attacked Novas, and probably tried to attack Lorath as well. We hear as well of the lost city of Liber, where acolytes of a spider goddess and a serpent god fought an endless bloody war. Interesting. Who is this goddess that Garth is fighting an endless bloody war with? East of them stood the kingdoms of the centaurs, half man and half horse. Gods and centaurs. Sounds like a magical place. In the southeast, the proud city-states of the Carthia rose. In the forest to the north, along the shores of the Shivering Sea, were the domains of the Woods Walkers, a diminutive folk whom many maesters believe to have been kin to the children of the forest. Do you think these Wood Walkers may have been descendants of the children that follow Garth to Essos? Between them could be found the hill kingdoms of the Sumeria, the long-legged Gips with their wicker shields and lime-stiffened hair, and the brown-skinned, pale-haired Zakora, who rode to war in chariots. 
Most of these peoples are gone now, their cities burned and buried, their gods and heroes all but forgotten. Of the Karthi cities, only a Karth remains. Sounds like Karth has been around for a long time. They probably know a lot of shit. Westeros remembers the conquerors as the Sonori, for at its height, their great kingdom included all the lands watered by the San and its vassals, and the three great lakes that were all that remained of the shrinking Silver Sea. This gives us a time frame. The Silver Sea has dried up, so this must have been towards the end of the Dawn Age. They call themselves the Tall Men. In their own tongue, the Targes Fen. Long of limb and brown of skin they were. Isn't there a clan of free folk called the Fens? They trace their descent to the hero king they called Huzar Amai, the Amazing. Born of the last of the Fisher Queens. Oh look, Ezor High got with one of the last of the godly Fisher Queens and had a son that he basically gave his name to. Ezor High, his or am I, I gotta say they sound pretty similar. Who took to wife the daughters of the greatest lords and kings of the Gips, the Sumeria and the Zakora, binding all three peoples to his rule. His Zakora wife drove his chariot at his head. His Sima wife made his armor, for her people were the first to work iron. And he wore about his shoulders a great cloak made from the pelt of a king of the hairy men. He took three wives to unite three tribes one of which were the first to work iron. He wore a pelt of a hairy man. Sounds like his son was a warrior. Such a man may or may not ever have existed, but none can doubt the glory of the tall men at their height. Oh, I'm sure he lived, but let's leave these tall men for now. And let's move on to these men of Ib. Ib. Through the centuries, many different peoples have made their homes upon the shores and islands of the Shivering Sea and sent their mariners across its chilly, grey-green waters. The most enduring and significant of these are the Ibanees, an ancient and taciturn race of islanders who have fished the northern seas since the dawn of days from their homes upon the Ibish Isles. These people have lived here since the Dawn Age? Let's see if we can figure out how they got there. The Ibanees stand apart from the other races of mankind. They are a heavy people, broad about the chest and shoulders, but seldom standing more than five and a half feet in height, with thick, short legs and long arms. These people kind of sound familiar. Their faces characterized by sloping brows with heavy ridges, small sunken eyes, great square teeth, and massive jaws seem brutish and ugly to Westerosi eyes. Their hair is dark and wiry. Ibanese men are heavily bearded. Wiry body hair covers their arms, legs, chests, and backs. Wait a second, I got it. The Sathori are big bone creatures. The Ibanese are a heavy people. The Sathori are massively muscled. The Ibanese are broad about the chest and shoulders. The Sathori have long arms. The Ibanese have short legs and long arms. The Sathori have sloped foreheads. The Ibanese have sloping brows with heavy ridges. The Sathori have huge square teeth. The Ibanese have great square teeth. The Sathori have heavy jaws. The Ibanese have massive jaws. The Sathori have thick skin that is brindled in patterns of brown and white. The Ibanese have wiry body hair that covers their arms, legs, chest, and back. It sounds like the hairy men that were attacking the colonies may have been native to Sathorios. So the brindle men and the hairy men are probably the same creatures. Though the men of Ib can father children upon the women of Westeros and other lands, the products of such unions are often malformed and inevitably sterile in the manner of mules. Ibanese females, when mated with men from other races, bring forth naught but stillbirths and monstrosities. Sathori women cannot breed with any save their own males. When mated with men from Essos or Westeros, they bring forth only stillbirths, many hideously malformed. The Sathori and Ibanese definitely seem to be related, even though they live on opposite sides of Essos. The Sathori women may have not been able to mate with other humans, but could they possibly mate with Garth? and their union created the Ebenese that we know today. Ib is a land of great gray mountains, ancient forests, and rushing rivers. Its dark interior, a haunt of bears and wolves. Giants once dwelt on Ib, we are told, but none remain. Though mammoths still roam the island's plains and hills, and in the higher mountains some claim unicorns can be found. This place seems kind of similar to Westeros. I can see the gods of forest, streams, and stone ruling on this island. Gray and gloomy, the port of Ibn has ruled over Ib and the Lesser Isles since the dawn of days. The port is dominated by the ruins of the God King's Castle, a colossal structure of rough-hewn stone that was home to a hundred Ebenezer kings. The God King's Castle was rough cut from a stone and was the home of a hundred Ebenezer kings? Sounds like a hint to me. Far Ib, second largest of the Ebenezer Islands, Ibsar, 
Its only town was originally a place of exile and punishment, where the Ibanese of old sent their most notorious criminals, often after mutilating them so they might never return to Ib itself. Though that practice ended with the fall of the god kings, Ibsar retains an unsavory reputation to this very day. What if Ib itself is a penal colony? After Hizoramai defeated the Hairy Men, all the survivors were exiled to Ib and manipulated, turning them from beast-like creatures into more human-like creatures. And then Azor Ahai's descendants, the God Kings, just repeated what he did. The men of Ib have not always confined themselves to their islands. There is abundant evidence of Ibanese settlements on the Axe, on the Lorathi Isles, and along the shores of the Bitterweed Bay and the Bay of Dusks in the west, and Leviathan Sound and the Thousand Islands in the east. Don't forget they attacked Novas as well. And history tells of several Ibanese attempts to seize control of the mouth of the San, attempts that brought the hairy men into bloody conflict with the Sonori sister cities, Sars and Saras. This sounds like the history of their ancestors. They attacked the Sonari, and his Oramai wore a pelt made of the skin of a hairy man. So from Ib, he's not too far away. It looks like if he continues east, he'll hit the Thousand Islands, and then he's just got to drop south into a shy. So let's continue east in the Shivering Sea. Still farther east lie the so-called Thousand Islands, a sea-girt scatter of bleak, windswept rocks believed by some to be the last remnants of a drowned kingdom, whose towns and towers were submerged beneath the rising seas many thousands of years ago. For the people of these islands, though few in number, are a queer folk, inimical to strangers, a hairless people with green tinged skin who file the teeth of their females into sharp points and slice the foreskins from the members of their males. A green skinned people whose women file their teeth and they cut the foreskin from their males? Does this not sound reminiscent of Nissa Nissa's violation? They speak no known tongue and are said to sacrifice sailors to their squamous fish-headed gods. These people must be some sort of cross between the Deep Ones and Garth Greenhand. They also practice blood sacrifice. They're surrounded by water on all sides. These islanders fear the sea so much that they will not set foot in the water, even under threat of death. These people probably fear the water because the great flood that drowned the city of their ancestors. There we go, the Thousand Islands. He mated with some strange fish-headed gods there and created some strange fish-headed people. But now he can drop into the Golden Empire of Yiti. So let's see what happens to him there. Yiti. In ancient days, the god emperors of Yiti were as powerful as any ruler on earth. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare all the lands between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the great and holy Isle of Leng, formed a single realm ruled by the god on earth, the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and maiden made of light. He is the only son of the Lion of Night which you could look at as a misunderstanding or a mistranslation. It was supposed to be the Long Night, or the last hero that saved Nissa Nissa might have been a knight of a Lion Lord. And then, of course, Nissa Nissa imbibed the darkness, making her the maiden made of light. Who travel about his domains, in a palanquin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. The carved palaquin made from a single pearl has to be a white stone that fell from the sky. Then him being carried by his 100 queens is our symbolic signifier, and these are his 100 wives that he got from the 100 kingdoms of yore. For 10,000 years, the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebears. I think 10,000 is wrong here, and I'm going to blame this error on whatever scribe had to recopy this book a thousand years ago. I think it should have been he reigned for 2,000 years before he had to return back to Westeros. And for now, we're gonna follow him, and we will come back and finish off the Great Empire of the Dawn later. No discussion of E.T. would be complete without a mention of the Five Forts, a line of hulking ancient citadels that stand along the far northeastern frontiers of the Golden Empire between the Bleeding Sea and the Mountains of the Morn. The Five Forts are very old, older than the Golden Empire itself. Some claim they were raised by the Pearl Emperor during the morning of the Great Empire to keep the line of night and his demons from the realms of men. I think more than likely that these were built by Garth on his way back to Westeros, and that's why it is believed that they were built by the Pearl Emperor. And indeed, there is something godlike or demonic about the monstrous size of the forts, for each of the five is large enough to house 10,000 men, and their massive walls stand almost a thousand feet high. 
This place is massive and capable of holding many thousands of people. To me, it seems more like a meeting place than anything else. Until at last the children understood that they could not win. The first men, perhaps tired of war, also wished to see an end to the fighting. The wisest of both races prevailed, and the chief heroes and rulers of both sides met upon the isle in the god's eye to form the pact, giving up all the lands of Westeros, save for the deep forest. The children won from the first men the promise that they would no longer cut down the weirwoods. All the weirwoods of the isle on which the pact was forged were then carved with faces so that the gods could witness the pact, and the order of green men was made afterward to tend to the weirwoods and protect the isle. With the pact, the dawn age of the world drew to a close, and the age of heroes followed. So we're told in this passage that the children and the first men come to an agreement. The children will keep the deep forest, while the men will get all the land. The men also agree to stop cutting down the weirwood trees and agree to take the old gods as their own gods. But there has to be more to the pact. How many people were sacrificed to open the eyes of these weirwood trees on the Isle of Faces? Why is guest right so important to the first men? And then why does Krasta sacrifice his sons to the others? It seems like all this was probably part of the original pact. Winterfell. The greatest castle of the north is Winterfell, the seat of the Starks since the Dawn Age. Legend says that Brandon the Builder raised Winterfell after the generation-long winter known as the Long Night to become the stronghold of his descendants, the Kings of Winter. Okay, hold on a second. Winterfell has been the seat of the Starks since the Dawn Age. Legend says that Brandon the Builder raised Winterfell after the generation-long winter known as the Long Night. But the Long Night was not supposed to happen until sometime during the Age of Heroes. So that means the timeline's off. There must have been more than one Long Night. The original one is when Nissa Nissa was violated and her scream destroyed the fiery moon. The second Long Night must have been when the others originally came. And then Azor Ahai, Garth Greenhands, Bran the Builder, whatever you want to refer to him as, had to come back to Westeros from the Great Empire of the Dawn. And together, the First Men with the children and probably the others came to a pact. The hints are there, you just have to seek them out. There's so much that we can theorize about the pact. So we know the first men agreed to worship the old gods. They agreed not to cut down the weirwood trees. They cede the deep forest to the children of the forest. But what else happened? How do you open the eyes of a weirwood tree? Were there people sacrificed in order to open those eyes? Why is guest right so important to the first men? If Nissa Nissa invited the first men to her island and they violated her, I think guest right would be part of the pact. Now this is where I think the others first come to Westeros. And it took a generation for Garth Greenhand to make his way back from Ashai to Westeros. The real question is why did the others come in the first place? They must have had access to the Weirwood Net and were able to see what was happening within the world. At which point they wanted to be a part of this great new world that Azor Ahai was creating. So they came down from the utmost north to terrorize Westeros until Azor Ahai showed back up. At which point they all come to a pact. Garth takes the name Bran the Builder and I'm fairly certain that he would have had to take a dragon glass dagger to the chest. Making him the first king of winter. But I think this is going to wrap up our episode on the pact. And I'm not going to continue on with the Age of Heroes unless this video gets 100 likes. So if you want me to continue with this series, make sure to like. And if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. If you'd like to join the discussion, we have a Discord and the link will be in the description. If you don't know what else to watch, check one of these videos linked at the end. Once again, my name is Teach and I hope there will be a next one. Bye.